Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Richard Engel, our, uh, Marcel Day's National Capital Region Office Manager here in Alexandria, Virginia. For those of you who are maybe online who haven't met me, I'm pleased today to be hosting this uh, latest monthly installment of Marcel Day's Wildlife Conservation Awareness Campaign. It's a year-long effort by the company to host uh, speakers talking on specific uh, wildlife conservation issues. Uh, this month, we're very fortunate to have Kristen Urensek with us, who is the Vice President uh, for Education and uh, Research and Education at the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. Uh, Kristen's going to be talking today about sustaining our ocean and the need for ocean leaders. I'd like to give you a little background on Kristen and her organization. Um, the, ocean Consor the Ocean Leadership Consortium is a Washington, D.C. based nonprofit organization. Uh, that represents approximately 100 leading public and private ocean research and education institutions with the mission of advancing ocean research, education, and sound ocean policy. And Kristen's been with Ocean Leadership since 2001, is that right? Okay, during that time she's had a number of very interesting assignments, including one I find very fascinating. From 2003 to 2011, she was program manager for the International Census of Marine Life Program. Uh, since then, she's moved on to her, her current position, where as Vice President, she provides strategic and programmatic oversight for Ocean Leadership's research and education programs, including Ocean Leadership's role in the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, uh, supporting the Interagency Ocean Observing Committee, and also the no National Ocean Sciences Bowl, which I think is very interesting, sort of an its academic program on, on ocean issues for, for high school students. So. Uh, Kristen has received her Bachelor in Science from uh, Environmental Science, Geosciences from Boston College and her Master, uh, MS in Earth Sciences from Boston University. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn the, uh, the mic over to her so she can give her presentation. And it'll be time after her presentation for uh, individuals and, and offices to ask questions. So with that, Kristen, welcome. Thank thanks, you. Richard, and uh, Thank thanks, for everybody for having me here today. Um, Richard already gave a pretty good introduction, but I'm the Vice President for Research and Education Programs at the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. Um, with the exception of a couple, I wasn't going to go into too much detail about the program management side of things that we do, but focus more on sort of the member services. Um, as Richard said, Ocean Leadership is a nonprofit organization in Washington. Um, we represent currently about 90 of the premier ocean science institutions in the U.S. and internationally, and our mission is to advance ocean research, education, and sound ocean policy. So on behalf of our members, we advocate for ocean research and for the best available science that can support um, conservation, management, and policy solutions. So the bulk of my talk today is going to be about why we need ocean leaders. Um, first, just a little bit more about my background. I um, have a master's degree um, in earth sciences from Boston University. My research there focused, it, focused on paleo-oceanography, which is the chemistry of deep sea floor sediments and what that can tell us about um, past conditions in the ocean, such as related to geological time scale changes in climate. Um, following my degree, I spent a little bit of time working in documentary film where I um, mainly supported um, short films and multimedia for National Park Visitor Centers and Museums. Um, and that production management that I learned um, translated pretty well to science program management, which is what ultimately led me to ocean leadership. Um, in my 14 years of ocean leadership, I actually had um, the privilege to work on a lot of really amazing programs. The Census Marine Life was one of those. And um, I'm really happy with this wildlife conservation series to have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about it, again, because it ended in 2010, so it's been a couple of years. Uh, the Census of Marine Life was a pretty huge international effort. Um, over 10 years, it had 2,700 people participating from 80 countries. Um, it was a $650 million effort. Um, we had 17 field programs under the umbrella of the program, and together they had 540 scientific expeditions. So even with all that, um, and Census of Marine Life being only one of many scientific initiatives that have taken place in the ocean over hundreds of years, 
um, only 95% um, of the ocean still remains unexplored. So why does that matter? There's a lot of water in that picture. <laughs> the ocean covers 70% of our planet's surface, which I'm sure most everybody in the room and watching online knows. Um, because the volume is so great, it also actually encompasses 99% of the living space on the planet. So what do we know about life in this enormous habitat? 250,000 species from the ocean are described and named. This is a fairly rigorous process to undertake. The census itself in its 10 years um, discovered 1,200 of those new species, and that's just a few examples on the screen of some of the ones we discovered. In addition, it collected um, 5,000 plus specimens that represent potential new species that are still sitting in jars, on shelves, waiting to be de formally described and named. Um, as I said, this taxonomic process is fairly rigorous. And I'd also add that funding and training for the discipline are diminishing. So it doesn't help us with that issue and the backlog of specimens. <clears throat> at the time the census ended, we estimated that there were at least one million different species existing in the ocean. Since then, um, more recent analysis has uh, increased that estimate by more than, more than doubled that estimate. And so that means that there are probably 90% of species in the ocean yet to be discovered. This huge gap in our knowledge is important because ocean life provides half of the oxygen we breathe. Um, it removes a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. Um, globally, we eat a lot of things that come from the ocean. Ocean life also provides numerous pharmaceutical discoveries that benefit humans. Uh, some examples are a Caribbean sponge that generates compounds used in AZT, a medication to fight AIDS. Uh, another specimen from the Caribbean, a coral that produces compounds with anti-inflammatory processes. Skates um, have provided clues to treating vision problems. Um, and microalgae are used in uh, vitamins and other nutritional supplements. Knowledge of marine life can also aid us in some other unexpected ways. Um, some of you may have read Marine Life was in the news recently um, with, when uh, a piece of the Malaysian, missing Malaysian Airlines plane washed up on an island. Um, the barnacles that attach themselves to this type of debris, um, if you analyze the chemistry of those, it can tell you um, something about the conditions of the ocean through which that debris has traveled. And so you can get an idea of maybe where the plane crashed and where it traveled to where it washed up and hopefully help us locate other parts of the plane or the plane itself. Um, so with all of this, um, what else do we not know? What else is left to be discovered in the ocean and learned about life in the ocean? And what are the major threats to ocean life? Um, obviously, there's climate change and ocean warming. Global sea surface temperatures um, increased over the course of the 20th century and continue to rise. Over the past three decades, we've seen the highest uh, temperatures since any other time where we've been collecting reliable observations since 1880. Um, as this figure shows, the oceans are also becoming more acidic as a result of absorbing so much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The result is that many organisms that build their skeletons and shells from calcium carbonate, like oysters, coral, and the pteropod that you see on the screen, are going to have a difficult time building and maintaining those structures. So the photos here show that our pteropod, who's at the very base of the food chain, its shell is slowly dissolving with exposure to low pH seawater, like the pH that is predicted for the year 2100. So when these shelled organisms are at risk, the entire food, risk, uh, food web may also be at risk. And of course, there's also humans. Um, we humans use the ocean in so many ways. This is um, a map showing the marine transportation routes in the 1700s. Today, um, ships are covering way more ground in the ocean as they're transporting people and goods around the world. Um, as an aside, these ships also represent an opportunity for more oceanographic sampling as they just go about the course of their business. Uh, in the late 1800s, 
oil and gas exploration could hardly be considered offshore. Today, we have events like the Deepwater Horizon, which took place 250 miles offshore and in water 5,000 feet deep. And we have companies on the verge of drilling in the Arctic, where we know far less about the ecosystem and have less infrastructure in place to respond to any incidents. Our technology to catch fish has certainly improved. We went from small boats and small nets to fleets of ships with large towed nets and long lines that are often catching species other than those that are targeted. We're depleting the ocean of large fish. Um, in this historical study, which was part of the Census of Marine Life, um, we looked at records of, um, from trophy fishing in the Florida Keys. Uh, they found this photo from 1958 showing a happy family returning with their catch of very large groupers. In 2007, the size and type of fish from the very same charter boat enterprise um, looks very different. The human footprint on the ocean is great. This figure is from a study published in 2008 in Science that synthesized data on the distribution and intensity of human impact on the ocean. Um, as you can see, there's only almost no part of the ocean that's untouched by humans. The only places where we see very low impact is around the North and South Pole. Um, but the warming Arctic may soon change that. Human exploitation of ocean life through unsustainable practices in the last few hundred years has had a tremendous impact on marine populations. This figure, which was also from a census of marine life study, shows by the dark green figure, uh, dark green bars, the percent decline in particular animal groups um, from historical levels. The news is not good. Um, all of these populations declined by more than 70%. However, in a few cases, um, I don't know if I have a pointer, but such as uh, the whales, um, seals, birds, and to some extent ground fish like flounder, um, they have seen some recovery following better management and um, policy, uh, conservation policies. So the biodiversity of an ecosystem supports its resilience, which is why ecosystems that are more impacted by humans through pollution or overfishing um, are much less resilient to other um, impacts, such as from climate change. The combined impact of all of these things is actually greater than the sum of its parts, but we don't really yet fully understand um, what that interplay is between the various pressures on marine ecosystems. And so if we also don't know what species are living there and the role that they play in the ecosystem, how are we going to manage for resilience? And then we have the media. So the media tends to sensationalize the dangers of the sea. In particular, I know this summer, and I think the past few summers at least, we've seen a lot of headlines like this um, featuring shark attacks and sightings of huge sharks that people don't like to see so close to their beaches. Um, this leads people to think that they're putting their lives in danger just by stepping into the ocean and certainly doesn't help um, in terms of generating a public that cares a lot about the ocean. Um, but there was a study actually published just that last month that looked at data from the past 60 years and determined that the risk of shark attack actually de decreased over the course of that time by more than 91%. Um, and so the seemingly more frequent attacks are actually the result of increased media coverage and increased ocean recreation, but not of risk, the risk of an attack itself. And so the ocean is a deep, dark place. Um, we can't see what's under the waves while we're standing on the beach or out on a ship. Um, and we have nautical stories that tell us about Jaws and about the Kraken and giant squid and all of these things in the ocean, they may, may do us harm. Yet we know that life on Earth is only possible because of our ocean. And understanding how the ocean and life in it functions is critical to creating um, policy to sustain or conserve it. And that's where ocean leadership comes in. Oops, sorry. I should put that down. At a time when we most need ocean and earth science research, we're facing really big challenges in, in Washington. 
So we have caps on discretionary spending, which impacts the federal investment in science. Um, we have the politicization of science, where climate skeptics are broadly connecting geoscience to climate science and slashing agency budgets for earth and ocean science research. Um, and then we also have the peer review process itself, which is so critical to ensuring scientific quality. That's under attack in Congress as well. So ocean leadership serves as the voice of ocean science in Washington, fighting against all of these issues. And we don't advocate for or against any specific conservation action, um, but representing our research and education institutions, industry, aquaria, other nonprofits, we serve as the neutral advocate um, in Washington for scientific capacity and understanding, for ocean research, and um, for utilizing the best available science in decision making. So one of our goals right now is to bring new voices into that conversation. Um, the ocean is significant for sustainability across so many issues, um, the climate, the environment, the economy, national security, food provision. And so because it touches so many sectors, it's really important for us to work together and carry the same message and the right message. Um, we have an emerging initiative at Ocean Leadership to bring together um, the military community to help frame the conversation um, as a trusted uh, community, especially among conservatives in Washington. Um, so underwater warfare, the need, to, um, the need to find Russian submarines and hide our own was at one time the driving um, force behind science, ocean science funding in this country. But today, we also have national security issues for which ocean science can help support understanding and solutions. Uh, issues such as uh, food security uh, and fishing piracy. The Arctic, where new transportation routes and seafloor, seafloor access are opening up. And China, who's creating a challenging new geopolitical environment by planning for man-made islands in the South China Sea to stake its economic claim. Um, all of these things uh, ocean science can help support. We're also working to increase um, industry's engagement in the conversation. Industry has a vested interest in ocean science um, from a business development, from many industry of business development perspective, from a business sustainability uh, perspective, as well as um, to support the STEM workforce needs that they have for the future. Um, and that STEM workforce needs brings me to our National Ocean Sciences Bowl, which Richard um, mentioned in the introduction. Um, NOSB, as we call it, is Ocean Leadership's flagship education program. Um, it's not enough for us to bring together today's ocean leaders, but we have to also support tomorrow's ocean leaders. So the NOSB is a national uh, high school academic competition. We reach about 2,000 students per year in 25 regions across the country. Um, two of those regions uh, support students in the Northern Virginia DC area and Southern Virginia. That's our Blue Crab Bowl in Southern Virginia, the Fredericksburg area. Folks would participate in that. and. Um, here in the D.C. area, we have the Chesapeake Bay Bowl. We do also have three bowls in California and two in Texas. I understand you also have offices there. Um, so the winners of the regional bowls advance to compete in a national finals competition. The 2016 national finals will be on the coast in North Carolina with the important theme of coastal resilience. So the NOSB supports U.S. Uh, high school students in a number of ways. The first is that it provides exposure um, to ocean science and to the issues I've been talking about today um, in this talk. There was a study in 2013 that indicated that fewer than half of high schools in the US actually offer some kind of earth environmental ocean science course, kind of lumping those together so we can't even really tease out how many would be ocean. Um, but that's not a great figure. And so the NOSB is one of only a few ways that high school students have to get exposure to this field of science and to potential career paths in it. Um, and this is crazy because with the emphasis on um, improving STEM, science, uh, technology, engineering, and math skills in our students, the ocean actually represents an ideal 
interdisciplinary platform for STEM learning. And the ocean also appeals to a number, a broad range of student interests because it touches all of the scientific fields, biology, chemistry, physics, geology. It also touches technology, engineering, and math. Um, and it also takes these basic scientific principles and applies them to real world scenarios, which is uh, very important for improving critical thinking skills in our students. Finally, studying and working in the ocean um, present challenges that stimulate innovation and technology and engineering solutions, well, which we need in this country. So the bottom line is the NOSB uh, develops in our next generation stronger students with an understanding of our changing ocean environment so that they can help us address um, the growing environmental challenges we have in our ocean and in our planet. And these students are not only themselves becoming better ocean stewards, but our anecdotal evidence is telling us that they're actually informing their families um, and thus helping us grow that ocean aware constituency that we need to help take our country to where it needs to go in the future. So um, basically that's uh, a very brief overview of some of the, of, of the issues and needs for an ocean leadership and what we're doing um, to help support that. So. Thanks again for having me, and I hope for some good discussion. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, what we'd like to do is uh, offer everyone the opportunity to ask questions of Kristen. I think what we'd like to do is to uh, go through the, uh, start with uh, the Marsdale Day offices, and then for those of you who are live streaming, I understand that you can tweet questions uh, via hashtag StandWithWildlife, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, very good. Um, and, uh, also, I'd like to do, now do we want to ask, have live questions or do we want to email from the Frederick's, from the Marshall Day offices? Are we going to, uh, um, yeah, people can ask, ask live, okay. live questions. All right, and if there are any other questions, I guess, that come up that people think of later, they can email them to Anne, is that right? Okay, very good. All right, what I'd like to do, I think we have, what, the three offices on the line. We, we, well, we have us live here in Alexandria and also Fredericksburg and, uh, Oakland. So I'd like to start here in the Alexandria office, and with all the interesting issues that and programs that Kristen has raised, I, I was wondering what questions the staff here in the NCR office may have. Sarah? Thank you, Kristen. I was wondering if maybe you could go into a little more detail about your outreach um, to the military and, and, and at what level you engage with leaders in the Department of Defense, that mainly at the congressional level, up, up here at headquarters, or are you actually working with the folks? at the installations where there might be ocean research going on. I'm thinking about Camp Lejeune, for example, in North Carolina. Yeah, not, not so much of, of the latter, but um, we're developing initiative. Um, so our, we have a new CEO at Ocean Leadership, fairly new, and I'm Sherry Goodman, and she was formerly with the uh, Center for Labor Analysis and the Military Advisory Board. And so they had a process there where they brought retired military leaders together with scientists um, on an initiative about climate um, and national security, and so we're, um, loose, you know, basing a new initiative um, on that to um, to talk mainly about oceans, uh, oceans and national security, and we're actually going to start with the food security issue. Um, that will probably be um, launched maybe later this year, at the end of the, by the end of the year. Questions? Um, I have which won't shock anybody. Um, can you talk a little bit about the issue of, the, since there's the Arctic Summit coming up in like a week, uh, where President Obama is speaking as well, um, could you address the, you mentioned that there are bigger problems in the Arctic vis-a-vis -vis freeing it up for oil drilling, because if I'm hearing you correctly, it's harder to intervene if there's a problem. So can you address some of the uniquenesses for the Arctic issues since that's high on the radar right now? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's just, um, for one, there's not a lot of infrastructure around the Arctic in terms of um, airports and places to launch um, a response from. Uh, ice also creates a problem. I don't think we've yet really mastered technology to help us track oil under ice, and so if we have a spill, um, we won't really know where it's going and can't uh, come up with a really great response plan. 
do some of the, just as a quick follow up, some of the things that worked in um, the BP spill were um, natural solutions. I mean, I think Kevin Costner's company actually came up with one that was a bacteria that ate oil or something weird. Anyway, are there any solutions like that that could work up there, or is it because the climate is so extreme that mm -hmm. A, we don't know, and or B, they don't work? I, I think that there are there are ways um, to translate some of the things that happened after Deepwater Horizon to the Arctic, but the conditions are different, and the oil is going to be different. The, the, oh. the consistency and chemistry of the oil under the Arctic is going to be different from that under the Gulf of Mexico. And we don't have enough study um, to look at, at, at how the oil will interact, um, and what the, I, I think we just don't have enough study that um, that can tell us what's going to happen um, in the environment if there's an oil spill based on those unique conditions. Great, thank you. Any other questions here in Alexandria? Okay, I'd like to um, now turn to the Fredericksburg office if anyone has any questions there. That's a good question. I guess it's hard to answer that without knowing what the research findings uh, would be. Um, so, yeah. The re I mean, what Ocean Leadership does is use, is use the scientific findings and the best available science to help advocate. Well, we advocate for that. Um, we wouldn't advocate for a certain action to be taken, but you hope um, that whatever the research shows, would show, if it showed that um, drilling in the Arctic would be a big mistake, you'd hope that decisions would follow that, and that's, we would play a role in at least making sure that decision makers knew that that information was available and that when they were taking it into consideration. Can I, can I follow up on that? Sure, please. I didn't bring my phone, so I don't, I don't I can't tweet. Um, so based on that, do um, you have any lessons learned from the deep water horizon, from the, uh, from the BP oil spill that you've been able to incorporate to be able to help with your ad advocacy on so, the impacts of the Gulf, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think, um, I think we will. Um, the program is about halfway through right now, and so a lot of the scientific findings are not yet fully analyzed, fully integrated, and, and yet put into terms that can help guide decision making. We have a lot of studies looking at different pieces of what happened, such as you know the microbial response, the um, doing better modeling of the currents and those sorts of things. All of these tools would then be available, but we haven't yet sort of synthesized them into something that gives you the big picture because um, sometimes findings may seem contradictory out of context or whatever, but you really need that integrated look to advise um, you know, future response, future. Um. I lived on the Gulf during that time, or right before that. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of um, naysayers and oh, the, you know, it's great. To, we're not seeing any effects. We don't. But there's, you know, we always heard there's that big dead zone out there, and there's lots of stuff, you know, out there. Just we can't find it, I guess. And so, how how do you combat that? Um. How do we combat not being able to find them? How do you, how do you, that, those, those negative, oh, the those, those, yeah, yeah. those naysayers and stuff? Um, it's a challenge. I mean, I, I think that uh, the community down there is still very skeptical, um, and skeptical of, of the research as well, especially because the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, um, while it has a completely independent scientific oversight and management, um, it's BP funded, and so there's going to be that natural skepticism. But um, but we just keep promoting the independence of the work. Um, we'll do our best to um, make sure that the public 
knows what we've learned after 10 years. Um, in, in instances like that, the, the impacts may not be immediately seen or known, and so you need the decade-long program to sort of figure out what really happened. Okay, back to Fredericksburg. Do we have any more questions? Hello, Jesse Suters from Marcelo Day, Fredericksburg, and my question revolves around the fact that we don't know the effects of the horizon spill, or, you know, the deep water horizon spill, but what we do know is we have all the historical data, right? We know what's happened in the past, we know how many spills there has been, so we should be able, right, to define what the risk is. So could you, could you do that for us? What is the risk with the, the, the the drilling in the ocean, and how do you feel like that translates to risk in the Arctic? Oh, I think we're getting way beyond my expertise <laughs> with that question. Um, it's a really good question. I don't, I don't know if anyone's quantified um, the risk, um, but I can certainly look into that and get back with an answer. Any more questions in Frederick Square? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, what is your uh, stance on the Convention on the Law of the Sea? Can you talk about that? From ocean leadership perspective, or my own? <laughs> um, no, I think uh, ocean leadership definitely okay. supports U.S. Um, signing on to the Law of the Sea. Um, there are too many, um, too many issues that we won't be at the table um, to help in decision making if we don't. We do, um, we do advocate for that. Any additional questions in Fredericksburg? <laughs> My question is, in the United States, I see most of the people, they don't have a connection like if you live in Virginia or Maryland, right, with the ocean or the, the coast. How do you have for your community participation the people in the large part of the country that really are interacting with the ocean the way some of us who live on a coast do. Yeah, we need to do a better job of that. And that's, that's part of our goal for bringing in sort of new voices into the conversation. We want to make sure that we're finding the things. I mean, the, the ocean, as I said, it, I mean, it plays such a big role in most of the things happening in the planet um, and, and for human society. And we need to do a better job of finding the, those things that the people in the middle of the country who don't see the ocean can connect to, whether it's um, you know, the uh, pollution from inland that makes its way down to the Gulf and creates the dead zone that you're talking about, um, or it's the fact that the ocean is helping, or you know, the ocean is playing a role in the climate change issue that's creating more severe droughts in California, and they're on the coast, but that's an example it will happen in, in the middle of the country as well. The way that the ocean plays into the weather that they're experiencing, all of this, whatever it is, and I'm not sure we've really found what is that thing that they're going to connect to, um, and they're not all going to connect to the same thing, but we're certainly not doing a good enough job. And so ocean leadership needs to find the new voices and ways to, to engage those people and make sure that, that they're engaging their politicians. Do we have any additional questions from Fredericksburg? Okay. If not, we'll move on to the Oakland office. Hi. I was just wondering, you had mentioned that um, recreational use of the oceans has increased over time. And I was wondering if you have any efforts to kind of engage users at that level who are just kind of using the resources to help them understand some of the issues or, or get them involved in being aware of what work you're trying to do? We don't, but there are certainly a lot of organizations out there that do. Um, you know, there's um, surf rider group that engages um, the surfing community. You have uh, recreational fishermen, I think they have groups that are um, pretty involved in those issues. Um, I think you make a good point that we could do better, I think, engaging with those associations themselves um, at that level. That's where I think we can, we can do more. Definitely take that suggestion back. 
Any other questions in Oakland? Yeah, uh, hello, my name is Alicia Beeler, and um, I was curious about the Ukraine conflict. Um, you know, I know that there's been some Yeah, so um, we do have some international members in Canada and um, Australia, and we're working to build our international membership a little bit more. Um, in terms of, so some of the programs we've managed, uh, these are grant and contract type work that we do for, on behalf of either the federal government or private funders. Um, that's where most of our international um, engagement has been so far, since Marine Life was one of those. Um, the International Ocean Drilling Program was another, um, and so we, you know, we work to build communities of scientists around the country on particular um, disciplines or scientific problems. Um, in the advocacy side, we're actually sort of just um, moving a little bit more into that arena. Um, one of the things we're looking at is the COP21, the um, uh, UN Climate Change Convention that's happening uh, at the end of this year in Paris. And we're working with a sort of um, sort of comparable organization to ocean leadership in Europe called the European Marine Board to um, utilize our joint memberships to develop a consensus statement on the need for ocean science in addressing climate change. And this is something that will then um, try to make sure has visibility to the people who will be doing the climate change negotiations in Paris. Um, and some other examples like that, I think, we'll be doing as we move forward. Um, ocean leadership's in a bit of a transition, and internationalizing what we do is um, definitely a high priority. Any additional questions in Oakland? Hi, Kristen. Uh, one more question from here. Uh, can you speak to any of the ocean hotspots that maybe we haven't spent as much time researching and, and that really are some of the areas that are most susceptible to you know impacts from some of these industries or um, or again we just haven't you know spent as much time researching them i know we've talked a little bit about the arctic we've talked a little bit about the gold but are there any areas from your um you know scientific and, and research background that you know this is really the next hot spot that we're all going to be reading about yeah, well, I mean, I think everybody knows about the Arctic. Um, the deep sea mining is going to be becoming um, a larger and larger industry and issue. Um, I know one place where there's been a lot of industry attention right now is called the Clarion Clipperton Fracture Zone. It's um, in the Pacific, sort of um, near Hawaii. Um, and I think that could be a hot spot. There's not, not a lot of research there. Um, at, right now, and it's uh, there's also there's already um, several companies with um, leases uh, ready to. I mean, they're not actively doing anything, but the leases are there, and, and um, it's only a matter of time. Any other questions from Oakland? Okay. Uh, no more questions here, Richard. All right, thank you. Anna, I was wondering, has anyone tweeted anything to us? We have. We have one question. Um, from someone in our Richmond office, and it's, what are things that average citizens can do to protect ocean wildlife? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, um, first of all, definitely be aware of what you're eating and where it comes from. You know, there's a lot of uh, organizations out there that put out seafood watch cards that you can carry around in your pocket and always know what are the sort of no-no seafoods uh, to eat and what are what is okay and what is um, preferred. Uh, that's an easy way. Um, and I think just the general, general things that we do um, to help the environment. I mean, be aware of where you're throwing your trash and how much electricity you're using. What's your carbon footprint? Because all, everything we'd be doing to support our land-based environment is going to also benefit uh, your ocean environment. Any other questions? I do. I had another question. You talked about conservation policies and how, in some cases, it actually has helped improve animal and marine populations. Can you talk about why those were successful and also considering the current climate on the Hill, are there other ways to get those policies passed? Um, yeah, I would love to address that question, but I think 
that's also not one I have the, the right expertise. Um, I don't actually get much involved in the policy side of that, mm -hmm. but I can ask that question of our policy director and, and get back to you. Okay, great. Um, I actually just got another question. <laughs> um, so, what food species are most at risk with respect to ocean acidification? Um, Yes, so our food species, uh, oysters, I think that's the one we've been hearing most about right now, especially in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. There, um, the oyster farms there are experiencing ocean acidification uh, incidents uh, that um, are destroying the juvenile populations and, and um, hurting the farming. But they've actually, I think, also are coming up with some mitigation techniques that are possibly um, something that can be upscaled to, uh, to help more nationally or in other parts uh, of the ocean, not just farms. Yeah, oysters are the main one. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, one last question okay. <laughs> from me. Um, so National Ocean Sciences Bowl is geared towards high school students. Yes. Is there any thought about maybe gearing it towards younger students and kind of catching them before they even enter high school and are thinking about these things? Yeah, we would love to do that. Um, we would love to do a middle school competition. We'd love to reach, we'd love to add regions to our own. Um, funding is our biggest challenge right now. Um, and the federal, the federal government, um, which basically launched and supported the program almost entirely for many years, is no longer such a major um, supporter for the program. It's, it went from 90% of our budget to 40%. Um, and so we've had challenges since. Um, we would love to grow, but it's not in the near-term horizon as we're sort of sh struggling through sort of reestablishing sustainability for the program. Yeah. And do you have any email questions? I don't. Okay, very good. Well, I guess I have one final question for you, Kristen, and that's in terms of what can we at Marstel Day do to help support ocean health and ocean resilience? Uh, we do a lot of stakeholder outreach and engagement. We try to identify conservation organizations who have a uh, common interest with our clients in terms of large landscape or large ecosystem conservation. Uh, what can we do? Are there any resources you recommend or any organizations we should be in contact with to, to help support uh, ocean resilience? I think working with ocean leadership. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I know you do a lot of work with the military, sure. so I, I assume that there could be some um, potential collaboration around um, you know, our ocean is a national security initiative, Excellent. whether it's um, input into the into those discussions and communication that occurs after. I mean, there are a lot of different elements of that that I think we can work together on. Um, and I think also if there are, there are ways we can support you. Um, we want to engage more industry in our advocacy, and so what are the challenges that you're facing in your work that we can help support you on? Okay, very good, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Very, very interesting presentation. I'd like everyone to join me in a round of applause. All right, well, I think that concludes uh, this particular presentation. Uh, I want to thank everyone for participating and uh, look forward to next month's. Take care now.